Michel Glenny, thank you for accepting our invitation and joining us for a short chat, I would say, an informal talk, which is occasioned by the publication of your book on the Balkans in Romania. Mm. We are really thrilled to be publishing this book, which came out in its original edition years ago, but meanwhile it has become a landmark in the history of the Balkans. Um, not only is it uh, a bestseller, uh, and it has become also a bestseller in Romania, but I understand it has been included in curricula and in bibliographies um, with universities. So this is really an accomplishment, and I think it's a sense of uh, your success with this book. Um, well, let me, uh, let, let, me, let me say straight away how right. really thrilled I am that it's being published in Romanian because um, it's, it's now been published in all Balkan languages except Greek. Um, so okay. I'm waiting for the Greeks to pick it up. <laughs> okay, your literary agent has to work on that. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's, uh, as you say, it was published a long time ago in the year uh, uh, 2000 uh, uh, originally, um, you know, which is, uh, wow, it's, it's, it's 20 years. I did update it about eight years ago in, in, in 2012. Oh. Um, but I don't know if you want to, uh, let me explain why I wrote, wrote the book because it will, I, it's, it's slightly it's different. excellent, from, sorry to interrupt. This was my yes. first question. What prompted yeah. you to write this book? So what was the driving force, the motivation of writing this book? So I've been, I've been working in Eastern Europe first um, for The Guardian and then for the BBC uh, throughout the 1980s and, and then the 1990s. And in the 1980s, uh, I first came to Romania in 1986-87, I think, uh, and uh, did a story on Ceausescu's palace in, uh, in Bucharest. Um, and uh, I was traveling all over Eastern Europe, but increasingly in Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia from 87 onwards. And then when the wars broke out in the former Yugoslavia um, in the 1990s, what I realized is that a lot of people were coming to uh, report what was going on in Yugoslavia and elsewhere, including Romania and including Bulgaria and uh, Albania. But there was no single volume narrative history of the region. There was the Yelovich two volume two volume history, which was important, and one or two other also very good older ones. Most people relied when reporting on Yugoslavia on Rebecca West's uh, mm -hmm. book of memoirs from the nineteen thirties, and so. Uh, uh, what I felt was lacking was a narrative history of the region as a whole that included uh, sort of some dynamic stories about, uh, about the region because a lot of the histories were quite dry academic, academic histories. Um, and uh, so in 1995, I think, I decided I would try and write this. Now, I knew quite a lot about the history, the modern history of the Balkans, in particular, the post 45 period, when I started writing it. And uh, I had done quite a lot of reading about Serbia and Croatia and Greece in the 19th century. But six weeks after I started writing the book, I realized that I had taken on an absolutely vast subject. And uh, it, it, what became clear is, is, first of all, I was going to struggle with the complexity of it. But secondly, there was this fundamental problem with the interpretation of the Balkans 
And that was the one phrase that the Balkans was the powder keg of Europe. Yeah. Right. That what that what that implied was that the Balkans was responsible for violence that spread throughout Europe. And what became very clear looking at the 19th century was that the people res primarily responsible were the great powers and that they were manipulating, exploiting and playing off against each other the various social groups within the emerging national states of the Balkans. So I think I say somewhere in the book that uh, it wasn't the Balkans that there were the, was the powder keg. The, the powder keg was Europe itself. Exactly. And that um, the Balkans was merely the fuse which was lit for the powder keg in Europe to, to explode. And so there was uh, extremely negative connotations um, to the Balkans as somehow intrinsically violent, intrinsically mysterious, which was really um, uh, uh, sort of exaggerated and confirmed from the 1880s, 1890s onwards, when you got a genre of particularly English and Irish literature, which had the Balkans as the most dangerous, mysterious place in Europe, which produced characters like Dracula, um, uh, and you had the prisoner of Zender as well at the same time. There's this whole um, genre, subgenre of English literature that places the Balkans as an area of violence, extremism, and unpredictability. And I felt it was time to let's step back and look at that and see whether any of that is true or not. Yes. Uh, you were very successful in doing that because actually when you read the book, this is the red thread of the book. I, as a reader, not as a publisher, yeah, as a simple, as a mere reader, I sense that, that you always try to look with fresh eyes. You also try to distance yourself from conventional misconceptions, from misconceptions, from conventional ideas. And this narrative, because the book is written like a narrative, um, is very wide opening, I would say. You, as I said, you distance yourself and you also have some very um, um, tongue-in-cheek remarks about <laughs> uh, British politicians, even, <laughs> about two prime ministers. Uh, I'm not disclosing uh, details of, of these uh, uh, points you make in the book, but uh, they are very poignant, I would say, to exactly this idea of how uh, this part of, of Europe was often perceived, even at political level, not only, you know, the, the general audience, people in general, but there were misconceptions or misinterpretations or just uh, lack of knowledge, I would say, at, at this level. You quote Tony Blair, John Major, I'm, I'm leave that to make the delight of our Romanian readers when they uh, come across this in the book. Well, it's uh, it's something that you know was revived throughout the wars in in Yugoslavia. Uh, the idea, for example, of uh, ancient hatreds, which became the narrative in the United Kingdom. We'll never get this place sorted out because. They are, these are ancient hatreds which we can't understand and they're essentially uncivilized. And you saw that interestingly emerge uh, in the discussions and reporting around Transylvania in uh, 1989, 1990 and 1991. Um, and what really fascinated me about Transylvania there was to demonstrate how important leadership and politics um, can be, because it did look for a moment in 1990, 1991 as though there could be a serious issue between Hungary and Romania over mm -hmm. Transylvania and the situation of the Hungarian minority in Transylvania. And on a state level, 
uh, Bucharest and Budapest realized that this was not in the two countries' interests. And so they were able to bring down the tension through sensible policies, which have mercifully um, sustained to this day, notwithstanding, uh, notwithstanding uh, Orban's positions on the Hungarians living outside of, of Hungary. But what that meant to me was that if you looked at Yugoslavia at the same time, these were not ancient hatreds. These were pre-existing tensions, that's certainly true, but they were consciously manipulated by Milosevic and, and Tudjman in particular. And if you go back through the history of the, the, the Balkans in the 19th and 20th century, there are always moments when there are some people who are trying to find rational ways out of um, the difficulty that the Balkans find themselves in. I, I mean, to give a Romanian example, I think Titulescu was, was extremely important in this, a really a, a very admirable politician who understood what the implications of failure um, would be. And unfortunately, he was, he, he was proved right. But you had a number of perceptive politicians who uh, clearly were able to reduce tension at critical moments. And what that does is that counters the idea that this is somehow an innate incapacity of Balkan politics to come up with uh, rational, rational solutions. You also speak uh, in your book about the interference of the great powers and later on, closer to our times, the, the, what we call the international community. <laughs> in, in the, yes, you, you uh, make this remark. Um, in uh, the inner politics of the region. And you state that, of course, there were uh, some interests that were followed by the great powers but uh, you note that um, very often the Balkans came on uh, the forefront of discussions whenever something bad was ha happening. Troubled times were, um, you know, bringing forth unfortunate events. But after that, all that followed was neglect. There wasn't, there wasn't a keen interest in building up policies in this region economically, politically, that will help this region in better integrate or build a peaceful um, atmosphere, um, peaceful relationship, cooperation. Yeah, well, it, it, there are some excellent examples of, uh, of that. First of all, I mean, you know, everywhere the great power interference was uh, was decisive. On occasions that would work to the advantage of um, the Balkan countries. Indeed, if you look at the period of uh, Romanian independence in the 1860 and, and 1866, um, the war between Germany and Austria um, and the uh, humiliating de defeat of, of Austria that was absolutely critical in enabling the, uh, the boyars in, in Romania to establish a union under a single king, Carol, of course. Um, uh, they were able to exploit the fact that all of them, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, uh, France, Britain, Germany, and Austria were watching very closely what happened in Romania. But actually on this occasion, it was their inability to act because of other problems going on, their disunity um, that enabled Romania uh, to, for the first time, establish itself as, a, as, as what looked to be the beginnings of a coherent modern state. But then you take another example, and that was the end of the First World War. Um, you get, uh, first of all, the, the role of the Balkans in, in the First World War goes much, much beyond Sarajevo. 
It's absolutely critical in terms of strategic control with the Germans desperate to get down to Turkey and, of course, the oil fields of Romania being extremely important. This was the first war when oil was a critical driver of much of the uh, of many of the uh, many of the uh, uh, many of the events. So there is this intense activity and violence in the Balkans during the First World War. Uh, and then uh, in the, after the settlement of uh, Versailles and the various sub-settlements of, of Versailles, the region is neglected. The Italians are allowed to bully Yugoslavia. Everybody bullies Bulgaria, and that's actually extremely bad news in the long term. But then you have the economic neglect of the Balkans, and this uh, magnifies the impact of 1929 on this still essentially agrarian society, um, so that uh, the Balkans suffers comparative to the rest of Europe much, much worse as a consequence of the Wall Street crash in 1929, and that accelerates the moves in some Balkan countries towards dictatorship, towards nationalism, towards populism, and towards fascism, uh, which in turn was preparing the ground for what happened in World War II uh, in the Balkans, which was absolutely terrible. Yes. Um, what I would be interested to know is your current opinion about um, what's going on in this part of the world? Well, um, it's a, 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 to follow on to your last question, I was going to say there is a partial exception to this uh, neglect. I will underline the word partial, but I will remind uh, us all of exception. And that is what the European Union did after... Um, really after about 2003, when it, had, uh, it announced that, well, no, actually before 2003, but in 2003, it announced that all the countries of uh, Southeastern Europe would be integrated into the European Union. Now, here's a very interesting case, because Romania and Bulgaria, of course, came in uh, even before Croatia, um, uh, after Slovenia, admittedly. And... This goes to show you uh, uh, about sensible politics. Yugoslavia, by every standard, was well ahead of Romania in 1989. And we were because, looking uh, in admiration to them during the it, Ceausescu years. Exactly, exactly. Ceausescu had wrought so much damage on the country on so many different uh, levels, but one of the the things that he'd done with his systematization program of the 1980s um, uh, and a very, very rapid payback of the, of the Western debt was to accentuate tensions in Transylvania so that the seeds were there for, for possible, uh, possible conflict. Yugoslavia, the European Union would have been happy to enter into negotiations fairly early on had the Federation managed to sustain itself. And what the war did was to place Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Macedonia, etc., way back behind Romania. And Serbs and Croats, who I, who I talked to at the time, they just held their head in despair saying, how could this possibly be that we allowed Romania and Bulgaria to come into the European Union before us. Now, there are, of course, problems with Romanian and Bulgarian membership um, uh, that, uh, that we've seen, and they become the object of criticism from some politicians in, uh, in the European Union. But I am, I've always advocated membership for Bulgaria and Romania as a very important step forward partly for cultural diversity, um, because there was a strong body of opinion in Northern Europe, which wanted to exclude any country that had any association, not with Islam, but with the Orthodox Church. 
uh, in any of its any of its form. And um, <clears throat> then there was deep suspicion of the issue of corruption and organized crime uh, in uh, Bulgaria and Romania. I've always argued that if you want to deal with that issue, you embrace people, you don't exclude them. Uh, and uh, over the past few years, Romania has shown that it is a lively democracy and that um, whilst it has very, very profound problems, people are aware of the problems, they're prepared to, to get out on the streets and express what they feel about what's been, <clears throat> what's been going on here. In some respects, Romania has made tremendous economic progress. In some respects, it still remains uh, very, very uh, uh, problematic. But we will not be able to see the region prosper as a whole, in my opinion, as long as the other Western Balkan states remain outside of the, of the European Union. But uh, I think, despite the tide of populism that we've had across Europe recently, that I think things are slightly beginning to turn at the moment. Brexit is seen as a failure by almost everyone in the European Union and an act of extreme self-harm by um, the English elite, and I say English rather than British. And Switzerland at the weekend, very importantly, voted oh, yes. not to restrict yeah. freedom of movement. Okay. And this is a sign that the populist response, which came after 2008 and the financial crash, um, is receding. And this gives me some hope the next hope is to see um, some of the Western Balkans make further progress of uh, integration into the European Union. And if you had Serbia and Macedonia, uh, Bosnia, Montenegro, Kosovo, however Kosovo plays out, and Albania in or close to, or much closer to the European Union, that would make life for Romania and Bulgaria easier as well, because there would not be that sense of physical isolation. Yes. Misha Glenny, um, I'm afraid our time is almost up. I am delighted that you accepted our invitation. Once again, I say that in genuine <laughs> admiration of your work. Um, I'm sure our conversation will be a great incentive for the Romanian readers to uh, go through your book. It's a sweeping history that has garnered accolades all over the, the all, all over Europe and not only. And um, one question that may arise, and uh, I anticipate that from the perspective of our Romanian readers, uh, because I had uh, some conversation about that. What is Romania? It's it's a kind of Define, it's about defining the region. What, yeah, is, what is, a, is Romania in a book about the Balkans? Lydia, so this is a, this is a very... It's you a, talk a, about very, this at the beginning of the book, and I think it would be great to anticipate yeah. uh, this question. Uh, first of all, because I felt uh, Romanian history had been slightly neglected in English in particular, uh, less so in German and in, in French, um, uh, but also because I had to make hard decisions at the beginning as to, as to what I include. And because of the fact that, um, I, in particular, that it was under the nominal control uh, of, the Ottoman, uh, of the Ottoman Sultan, uh, even though its arrangements were rather different um, from uh, those of other countries in the book. But of course, they were under the control of the Phanariots, who were Greece, who were Greeks. And so there was an important linkage there between Greece and, and Romania. And this was absolutely critical in the Greek war, war of independence, but also the fact that <laughs> Greeks were very important in the early promotion of Romanian 
uh, independent. Yes, we had a special <laughs> so, relationship, yes. So, um, media and the whole tradition. Exactly. And then uh, the other thing is, is that we in the United Kingdom tend to refer to the Balkans. In Germany, historiography has always referred to Südostelhofer, Southeast, Southeast Europe. And I think you can legitimately include Romania into Southeastern Europe right. um, without necessarily addressing the tricky question of what belongs to the Balkans and what doesn't belong to the Balkans. Because the Greeks, interestingly, they too feel sometimes feel slightly aggrieved about being... Uh, they'll concede that Thessaloniki is part of the Balkans, but they will not concede that Athens is part of the Balkans. And of course, the Croatians were absolutely horrified that they were <laughs> yes. part of the Balkans. But you're looking at it partly from a ge ge uh, geographical perspective, partly from a historical perspective, and partly from the perspective um, of uh, contemporary geopolitics. And some of that de definition comes from within the area, some of it comes from without the area. But I just thought it would be, uh, ultimately, it would be important to include Romania, because although you can sense in the book as well that it is a slightly separate history from yes. uh, from everywhere else. <clears throat> it nonetheless has patterns which intersect uh, very often, both in terms of its relationship with um, uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia in, in particular, and also at an earlier stage, Greece. And then, of course, there's the issue with, uh, with Bulgaria as well. Um, your introduction, actually, of the book, I think the first chapter, explains that at length. And I think it's a very, um, it's done in um, trust and honesty. And I think that it is uh, very compelling to, to the reader, actually. Um, we regret that we uh, don't have you as a guest in person. I know, it's of so course. sad. I mean, it would have been so interesting, so fascinating for everyone to have you um, with the lecture maybe here or just the launching event. But, well, I but Livia, when it's possible, when it's possible to uh, travel again, I would be only too happy to come to Bucharest, which I haven't been there for for quite a long, long time now. And the other place that I haven't been to for a long time and I would like to see again is Yash. So... Um, okay, so uh, we have already a map to arrange for your yes. tour. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that would be, uh, that would be great. And I have to say that what I, finally, I'd like to say what I want to contribute with this book is history is obviously a problematic and instrumentalized subject uh, throughout the throughout the region, and as somebody who is very sympathetic towards the countries and the peoples of southeastern Europe, but who comes from one of those great powers, as it were, who happened to be born in a great in what was once a great power, I want to try and. Uh, encourage the understanding between Balkan peoples and Balkan countries, Southeast European countries, um, that you do have a joint purpose, that you have a community of interests that is both historical and contemporary. And I want to see every country in Southeastern Europe prosper. Okay. And on this optimistic note, <laughs> <laughs> we bid you farewell <laughs> and hope to see you quite soon. Let's get over Me this too. Let's, period and see you in Bucharest. Let's do that. Thank you very much, Livia. Mulțumesc. Arrivederci. <laughs>